Hey guys, welcome back to the Dead Church series. Throughout this series, we've been looking at what Christianity looks like according to the Bible and how modern Christianity today looks so different than what the Bible actually teaches. We've gotten a lot of our definitions wrong. And because we've gotten our definitions wrong, we end up reading the Bible but we don't even understand what we're reading. We think it says something completely different than what it's actually saying. For example, we think we know what faith means, but we don't. We think we know what repentance means, but we don't. We think we know what it means to love, but we don't. And we think we know what it means to seek first God's kingdom, but we don't. We've brought our own definitions into Scripture and substituted God's definitions with our own. And then we don't understand what we're reading. And we don't understand why our lives don't look anything like what we read about in the book of Acts. If you're new to the series, I highly suggest you start at the beginning of the series and work your way through because all the videos are building one on top of another. You can find the link to the entire playlist right here. Okay, so as I said, our lives don't look like what we read about in the book of Acts. Growing up in the church, I would often read stories in the Bible and think, why isn't it like that today? I mean, look at what the Bible says life looks like when you know God. Enoch was taken up into heaven. Noah survived a worldwide flood. Abraham defeated four kings, he was visited by angels, and he saw fire come from heaven and destroy entire cities. Moses demonstrated God's power in Egypt with ten powerful plagues. He parted the Red Sea, he gave water to the Israelites from a rock, he gave them food in the middle of a desert, and God said that he spoke to Moses face to face. Joshua parted the Jordan River. He defeated Jericho by shouting and blowing trumpets, and he commanded the sun to stand still in the sky, and it obeyed him. Gideon defeated a massive army with only 300 men. Samuel prophesied, and not one word he said failed to come true. David defeated a giant. He overthrew kings. He was rescued from death on numerous occasions. Elijah stopped the rain for three years by praying, and he called down fire from heaven. He raised the dead, and he was taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire. Elisha made an iron axe head float on water. He healed the sick, and even after he died, a dead man was raised from the dead when his body simply touched Elisha's dead body. Isaiah saw God's throne room. Daniel survived a lion's den and repeatedly interacted with angels who told him the future. His friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survived being thrown into a blazing furnace. The apostles and the early church healed the sick. They raised the dead. They saw thousands saved. They had visions. They had dreams. They were taken up into heaven itself. Over and over again, the Bible is filled with incredible stories about how the people who know God see Him work in mighty ways, defending them, empowering them, and providing for them. And then we look at the modern church today, and we think, well, we had a cool worship service today. Guys, something's wrong. Christianity today is missing something. The power of God seen all throughout the Bible seems to be almost absent from the church today. And for many years, I saw this, and I always had the question, why? 
Why do our lives look so different today? Why don't we see God move in power like we read about in the Bible? The life most Christians experience today is so vastly different than anything we read about in the Bible. God seems distant. He seems far away. He seems uninvolved in our lives. We sing songs to Him, we say prayers, and we try to convince ourselves that we know Him, but we often really don't feel like we have a personal relationship with Him. We often go to church only because we feel like we have to, or because our friends are there and we want to see them. We read our Bibles because we know we should. If we spend an hour reading the Bible each day, we're kind of secretly impressed with ourselves. If we read through the entire Bible every year, we're considered devout because so few Christians read through the entire Bible at all. When we ask for things in prayer, we try to muster up as much faith as we can. Okay, Jesus promised us that we can ask for whatever we want, and as long as we have faith, we will receive what we ask for. Yet, despite how hard we try to believe, the sick often don't get healed. The dead often don't get raised. The lame don't walk. The blind don't see. The miracles are absent. And the only prayers that seem like they get answered are the minor ones that honestly probably would have happened even if we hadn't prayed at all. When we read these grand promises in the Bible and then look at Christianity today, it's really no surprise that so many people are leaving the church. I personally know many, many people who have walked away from Christianity entirely. They read the Bible, they see what the Bible says true Christianity looks like, and they're just honest. The Bible is not describing what we see in the church today. The closest thing to miracles that are happening in the church today are often easily explained with no need for a miracle whatsoever. These aren't the kinds of miracles we see in the Bible. The miracles in the Bible were undeniable. They were obvious. No one could question it, even those who wanted to. Most of the miracles seen today fall so far short of what the Bible describes that many people are just too honest with themselves to pretend like it's the same thing. No one who knew God in the Bible experienced life like Christians do today. No one in the early church experienced a Christianity like this. The Bible describes something so very different than anything most people see happening in the church today. So a lot of people decide the Bible must not be true, and they leave. Why? Why does the Bible describe something so different than what we experience? Why does the Bible promise things that don't happen? Does this mean the Bible's not true? Does this mean that Christianity is all a lie? Most Christians either give up on Christianity entirely, or they push these questions away because they're afraid that they're doubting. They ignore these questions, and they ignore the fact that their lives don't look like the Bible. They think that faith means being blind to facts. They think that faith means thinking something is true despite the fact that they can see with their own eyes that something is wrong. They think that faith means never asking any questions. But as we were talking about in an earlier video, that's not the right response. Peter tells us to make every effort to be certain that we are called and chosen. Peter's saying, this is the most important thing, so work really hard and make every effort to make sure that you are truly walking in the light. 
Okay, we are not making every effort to be certain that we're called and chosen if we just ignore the fact that our lives don't look like what the Bible says Christianity should look like. Christians are afraid to ask questions. And that is entirely irresponsible. Asking questions is not what it means to doubt. Asking questions is how you learn. Okay, the Bible warns us that many people will be deceived. They will think that they are Christians when they're really not. They will think they're following Jesus when they're not. They will think they're alive when they're really still dead. They will call Jesus Lord and he will say, I never knew you. They are deceived. How do they become deceived? Because when the deceivers came teaching a Christianity that didn't at all line up with what the Bible said, they told people not to ask any questions. They told people that asking is doubting and the Bible says not to doubt. But when the Bible says not to doubt, in the original Greek, it doesn't say doubt. It says waver. It's saying don't waver. Or in other words, don't go back and forth between two things. It's not talking about what you believe. It's talking about your loyalties. It's talking about fidelity. As we've been talking about throughout this series, faith in ancient Greek didn't mean faith. It meant fidelity. It meant loyalty. It meant believing and obeying at the same time. Faith and faithfulness. It wasn't about what information you believed to be accurate. It was about who you trusted and obeyed. So you're allowed to ask questions. Asking isn't wavering. Wavering is when you want both God and the world at the same time. And you're going back and forth and you can't decide which one you're going to live for. It's when your loyalties are divided. But asking questions is not wavering. Accusing God is wrong, but asking a question isn't wrong. Asking is simply when you want to learn. If you're asking God a question because you trust that there's an answer that you simply don't understand, you're not doubting. In fact, you're demonstrating more faith than most Christians have. Most Christians are afraid to ask because deep down, they're afraid that maybe the Bible's not true. So ask away. Feel free to ask God questions. Ask Him what's wrong. Ask Him what has to change. Ask Him, why does the Bible make promises and say that my life should look a certain way that it doesn't look like? And that no one I know who calls themselves a Christian has a life that looks the way the Bible says a life should look. Why? Why does Christianity today lack the power of God that we read about in the Bible? Why does Christianity today seem so different? Well, as it turns out, the Bible has the answer. Not only does it have the answer, but it told us ahead of time that this was going to happen. The fact that Christianity today seems void of the power of God is actually a proof that what the Bible says is true. When Paul described the apostasy that he said would one day fill the church, when he was saying that the church would fall away and the church would live for themselves and they wouldn't be true Christians, this is what he said. Remember this. In the last days, there will be terrible times because people will love themselves, love money, brag and be arrogant. They will say evil things against others and will not obey their parents or be grateful or be holy. They will not love others, will refuse to forgive, will gossip and will not control themselves. They will be cruel, will not love what is good, will be traitors, and will be reckless. 
They will be conceited, will love pleasure instead of God. Throughout this series, we've already talked about how this description is definitely a description of the church. It's not a description of the world. Because Paul concludes this whole paragraph by saying, avoid these people. And he says in 1 Corinthians 5 that whenever he tells them to avoid certain people, he's not talking about those in the world. He's talking about those who call themselves brothers or sisters, but who live this way. So here, when Paul gives this description and then says to avoid these people, he's saying people who call themselves brothers and sisters will live this way. And throughout this series, we've already talked about how the church today is full of people who love themselves. They love money. They're not holy. They don't love others. They don't love what is good. They love pleasure instead of God. It's because their definitions of all these words are wrong. They don't think this describes them, but it does. And it's the majority of Christians. It's the majority of people who are going to watch this video. If we understand what the Bible says these things mean and what God says these things mean, it's clear that this whole description Paul gives is a perfectly accurate description of the church today. Not from our perspective, but from God's perspective. Paul is not describing some end time scenario that's still going to happen someday. He's describing our current reality. We tend to not see it because we tend to not recognize that things haven't always been the way they are now. We were born into this reality, so we fail to see that Paul was describing a change that took place before we were even born. We read about the early church and we associate ourselves with them, despite the fact that our lifestyles, our love, our holiness, and our priorities all demonstrate that we're nothing like the description of the early church. Paul's description in this passage perfectly paints the picture of how God sees the modern church. Their lives are about themselves. Money is their priority. They talk bad about each other. They don't demonstrate the radical love of Jesus taught in Scripture. They often don't forgive. They gossip about one another. They lack self-control. They don't love what God says is good. They love pleasure instead of God. And when Paul describes this terrible state of the apostate church, he adds at the end, having an appearance of godliness, but will not have its power. The church today lacks the power of God that we read about in the Bible because the church today doesn't have the same relationship with God that we read about in the Bible. The church today is apostate. So many Christians are wanting to see the power of God that we read about in the Bible. They want to see the Spirit move. They want to see miracles. They want to encounter God in incredible ways. They want to experience the promises we have in Scripture. They want to experience the life Jesus promised to those who follow Him. But they don't know where to start. They don't know where to start because they don't know what's wrong. They know something's wrong, but they don't know how to fix it. They know something's wrong, but they can't figure out why. It's because their whole perspective is wrong. They read the Bible from the perspective of a modern Christian in the Western world and not from God's perspective. They don't recognize that it's not just the lack of power that's wrong. It's everything. If Christians truly want to see this change, they need to be willing to tear everything down and build from scratch. 
They need to reject American Christianity. They need to reject modern Christianity and everything about it and all of the comforts and all of the things that they tell us it's okay for us to have. And they need to reject all of the things that we accept as true Christianity that the early church never did and would never have done in a million years. We need to stop giving our money to buildings and staff and we need to give our money to the poor. We need to stop giving our money toward projects and Christian art and Christian film and Christian music. And we need to give our money to those who are in need. That's what the Bible teaches. We need to be willing to reject everything about modern Christianity. We need to be willing to walk away from it. We need to recognize that God says that is apostasy, that is honoring me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. You do not do what I want. You do not love me. That is not true Christianity. And we talked about that in an earlier video. You can find the link right here. Okay, but if Christians want to see the power of God, they need to be willing to tear everything down and build from scratch. They need to forget all of the things that men have taught them and all the religious traditions of men. They need to recognize that Paul is saying that this lack of power is a symptom of apostasy. Therefore, it requires a fundamental change. It requires Christians to go to Scripture instead of teachers and ask God to show them everything that's wrong in their lives. It requires Christians to transform from an appearance of godliness to actual godliness. And throughout these next few videos, we're going to look at the kind of life Jesus promised. We're going to look at what the Christian life is supposed to look like, and we're going to look at what the Bible says we have to do in order to have that kind of life.